Third John chapter one. Third John chapter one. Uh, all right, let's get into this word real quick. All right, we're starting a brand new series called "Me and You," your mama and your cousin too. <laughs> the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, John writes, "Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health." just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren, sisters, brothers and sisters, came and testified to your truth. That is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now, I'm going to add, for prophetic purposes, I'm going to add to this. I'm not taking a text out of context. I would never do that. I respect his word. But I want to show us the broader context of the soul, and I want to explore soul responsibility, okay? Especially in the areas of relationships. So this is our take on a relationship series, but we're not making it all about male and female. We'll get to that this, with this month. But the goal of this is every relationship you have before you engage, the reason why many of our relationships are troubled oftentimes is because we don't have a healthy EQ. Good. We don't have healthy intelligence around our emotional man. And so because we don't have a bridle on it, uh, we are not always good at relationships. Some relationships are not because of cheating. Or be, they don't end because of cheating or end because of, of a fight or betrayal or slander, whatever that looks like. It, the, the root of it is the emotional man was out of control. You get it? It wasn't just the act. It was what's behind the act. It was a person who had not been able to harness their emotional man. So as we journey through over the next few weeks, through conversation, through teaching, I want to do my best to talk about this. So today, I want to just tag this soul man. That's it, just soul man. I want to deal with that. Uh, I'm going to look at this verse again. Beloved, he talks to Gaius. He's, tells, he's telling Gaius, Gaius that I love you, whom I love in truth. I love you in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper, that you may do well in your life, in your personal, and in good health, that your body does well. Just as your soul, your mind, will, emotions, imaginations, intellect, as that prospers, I want your soul and your physical man and your life to all match. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Then he says, I was very glad when brothers, when people came testifying of your truth. Yeah. Let me see if I can translate this. I was glad that other people said that you actually look like what you believe. Yeah. And that you were consistent with what you say you believe. Yeah. You get it? Part of that is having our EQ. Now, this is psychological terms and things of that nature, but it has its place. We can find uh, argument in Scripture to let you know that soul work is not new. It's always been in the text. All right? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I'm asking you to stand with me today as I declare what you have given us uh, to, to feast on today. We love you so much. Help us be better for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, on your way down, just touch somebody next, next to you and tell them, I'm a soul man. Tell them. <laughs> soul man. <laughs> One of my favorite movies uh, back in the 80s, because I'm an 80s kid, I'm an 80s baby, you know, the 90s, I was like, you know, I was, I was cognitive of the 90s, fully cognitive, but the 80s, my God, that was a special time. I was talking to uh, Elder, Elder, Elder Williams uh, last week and his wife in the, in, the, in the foyer area, we were talking about music from that time and specific types of music, not just hip-hop now. We were talking about the R&B of that day. And, 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 and then how, even how tricked we were. Uh, not knowing that they were saying some of the things they were saying. But we would just love the music so much, we didn't know what they was really saying. 
until we knew what they were saying. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, today they don't do it, they just say it. You know? Back then it was like mystery until you had experience. You're like, oh, I, was just, I get it now, all right, all right. <laughs> it's a soul thing. It, there's certain songs that link you to a season and a moment of your life. Uh, when I was a kid, if I, if I hear the song, even now, if I hear the song Sailing by Christopher Cross, you know that song? All right, Sailing by Christopher Cross automatically takes me back to sitting in the back seat of my dad's uh, Cutlass. And my, we had one car at the time before he had his company truck. And uh, my mom would, would, we would drop him off at work. And at a particular time, it was playing on the radio. And this is when the cars had the two, the two, two doors. They didn't have the four doors yet. You had the two doors, but you had five seats. And so you had to flip that front seat all the way down, climb into the back of that mug, sit down. And you didn't have a window. You was at the mercy of the, first, the person in the front of you to roll that window down to make sure you got a breeze where you was. They didn't have no back seat uh, AC situations. No, you had to depend on the high blowing of the one in the front which oftentimes did not make it to you anyway. Then, as far as your enjoyment, you had a little slit in the back next to the big window. There was a little small one right here. As a kid, I would sit out there and look at that window, look at the stars, and just dream that I would be in the front seat one day. Because it was a big thing when your dad let you sit in the front seat. This is before we had, you know... Babies back then, you know, you, you take a two-year-old, you just, I'm a one-year-old. Matter of fact, you take a little Brielle and just strap her in regular. <laughs> Sit in the back, just. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we didn't care back in the old days. You'd be in the front seat holding the baby, just. <laughs> <laughs> it's the soul. The soul brings back memories. You hear certain songs and it, 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 it just it encourages the soul. It locks you to a moment, to a classroom, to a relationship, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to a season, to a club, to a, to, a <laughs> to a fight. Whatever it looks like, it just it links you back to a place and a space and, and it's linked to an emotion. There's certain things that, because what happens is in the moment of emotions being built in us, the tape recorder begins. And it locks into us in a way in our hard drive where we don't forget until something triggers that emotion again. We are an emotional people. So the question is, what is emotional intelligence? And I'm going to give you what I got for some psych. Anyway, emotional intelligence refers to the ability to identify. Say it with me. Identify and manage. What else? One's. Now, we got to stop there because real EQ, emotional quotient, is not you managing somebody else's emotions. And I think a lot of times we like to project, especially in relationships, we like to manage your emotions and ignore our own. And this causes problems in marriages and relationships. Y'all mind if I just talk today? I've been hollering all week. But just how we manage emotions is not managing our neighbors or managing our whoever we're in relationship with, but managing our own emotions, all right? First, as well as the emotions of others. We like to manage theirs. We don't like to manage ours. Don't talk to me that way. Well, what about you? You yelling too. <laughs> right? Oh, y'all, okay, uh-oh. That show is going to be one of them, huh? You praying? All right, please. You and your braids. Y'all pray. All right. See how they manage my emotions? Hey, she <laughs> see, she's got to manage hers right now. <laughs> All right. They've been coming for me every week. They be on this microphone. I said, as soon as I got the mic. Yeah. Anitra, you're going to know who the boss is. <laughs> All right. Let's keep moving. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand, let's read, read the next one, read it, uh, to understand, use, 
and manage your own emotions. How? So there are positive ways to manage our emotions. Then there are negative ways that we can use to manage our emotions. Right? To release stress, to communicate effectively. What else? And then what else? And what else? And diffuse conflict. How many need to learn some conflict resolution skills? Come on, lift your hands up. All right. Let's go to the Word. Y'all ready? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Next time, make sure I get a, a, a headset, y'all. Make sure I do that. All right. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you're watching online, make sure you share this. It's going to be a blessing to somebody. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 1, 26. I want y'all to, to look at something with me that I think is key for God, right? Key for us to understand ourselves, uh, Brandon, to understand ourselves. Here we go. Then God said, what did he say? Let us make man in our what? In our who? In our image and according to our? Uh, and then he says, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, birds, cattle on the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man what? In the image of God, he created him. What else? Male and female. He created them. Now, oftentimes when you see this context, you think to yourself, male and female. So there must have been a male spirit and a female spirit. That's not what that means. When it says male and female, he created them, it's Moses giving us context to the fact that both were created in the image of God. That's it. Simple. Mystery solved. It's what he's saying is, because remember, Moses is writing this by revelation. And Moses also backtracking. He said, for clarity's sake, let me just say this. Male and female, he created them. So she, too, is in the image and likeness of God. Now, here's the thing. We are not in the image and likeness of each other. We are in the image and the likeness of God. Say that with me. I'm in the image and the likeness of God. King James says the similitude of God. But we are not in the image, likeness, and similitude of each other. We are different, each and every one of us. We got arms, legs, and all that kind of stuff. But what we don't have is the same purpose which means we don't have the same function. But what does make us similar is the God part of who we are. That's image, likeness, and similitude, which means God gave us his emotions. God made us emotional. This is the image of and likeness of God. When we think about dominating and, 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 and having dominion and authority and uh, authority over the fowls of the air, the birds, and all that kind of stuff, we can't see that without seeing emotions. I want to argue this real quick, that emotions God gave us to help us dominate. So we can't see um, emotions as weak. They are actually the strength of God. So I think this is why I think when men don't understand emotions, we have men who dominate each other. Throughout history, there's always been nations trying to dominate another nation. And the reason why there's dominance in nations is because men misunderstand simple principles that emotions are not there to dominate others. They're there for the purposes of us to dominate in the earth, but not one another. You see what I'm saying? So God gave us emotions. Say with me, God gave us emotions. Now, here's the problem. Most theological frameworks don't like to argue that. Some do. Most, well, it's half and half. The sensationalists or those who believe that they're giving God complete sovereignty do not believe that God is emotional. They call it impassibility. Impassibility is actually a doctrine. Impassibility means that God is incapable of feeling pain. Therefore, if God is incapable of feeling pain, then those of us who, uh, who do things to offend God really can't offend God because God is unoffendable because he does not feel pain. He is beyond pain. The problem I have with that premise is it's not fully true. Are y'all here? 
Because impassibility says that he, he is incapable of being crossed. <laughs> we all know that happened in, in, with, with Lucifer. He's incapable of being traveled, which means pain doesn't travel through God. The respects of which they preach it in Orthodox theology teach this, that God, that traditionally denied God's subjection to passibility. What does it mean? Number one, it means that the external passibility or the capacity to be acted upon from without, which means God can be impacted from without himself. Are y'all here? Y'all got it? Number one, it means that God cannot be acted upon without himself or he cannot feel the emotions outside of himself which means something else can't make him feel a certain kind of way. Number two, internal passibility or the capacity for changing emotions from within, which they're saying in orthodox theology in some circles that God does, is incapable of even allowing himself to feel the transitions of emotions. They're saying in old theology that God can't be mad, he can't be happy, he can't have joy, he can't be sad, he can't be upset, he can't be disappointed that God is just God. Doesn't feel anything, he's just God. Does that make sense? Now, I can argue this in a moment. The third one is that sensational passibility or the liability to feelings of pleasure and pain caused by the action of another being, which means another being can't cause God to feel. Now, this doctrine is an old, classical, orthodox, theological doctrine that's not accepted by the wide world. But it is a strong doctrine, especially in a lot of your traditional, rigid, uh, reformational understandings. Can I argue this for a moment? Preachers, y'all with me for a quick second? The doctrine, this doctrine of orthodox theology of impassibility really means, as a tenet, that it is, the, it is rooted in the philosophical theology that the Greeks founded. So when the Greeks came to Christianity... Because there wasn't a whole lot of uh, books on an understanding of, they brought their Greek orthodoxy into the Christian experience. And they gave their gods, like Zeus and others, the inability to have feelings about a thing. And they ascribed that to the God of the Christian. And because it's written in early manuscripts... Not texts, but early manuscripts and writings and letters and things of that nature and, and schools of thought. These men applied that to early Christianity. Not in all circles, but in a lot of your uh, orthodox circles. Brought that into the equation that it respects and reveres a holy God, a God that does not feel pain. Here's the problem with that. The scripture is clear that when Jesus saw people who were hurting... My Bible says that God in flesh was moved with compassion. I'm only reading your scriptures, okay? My, my, my Bible says that when Jesus saw Lazarus and had known that he had been dead and he wept when he got there, the Bible says Jesus wept, possibly because of the unbelief or whatever, but Jesus had an emotion ascribed to the moment. Are y'all here? And so we can argue that, that the Greeks had brought in their influences into early Christianity. And now here we are years later unpacking and uprooting. And some people say deconstructing, but I don't like that phrase. But just uprooting some of the false uh, things that were ascribed to God. What was really what God left us to know about himself. God is emotional. I'm not saying he's out of control with his emotions. He is E.I. He, he is fully in control of his emotional man. That when he breathed the Ruach into Adam, he didn't just breathe purpose and why. He breathed a part of his emotional man. He activated the emotional man that he had created in man in Genesis chapter 1. So mankind is supposed to feel. Shout out that way. I'm supposed to feel. Say it again. I'm supposed to feel. I'm not supposed to be a hard case. There was nothing cute about not allowing yourself to let your emotions have its way. Y'all quiet today. Now, I know we as a people have been taught, suck it up. Especially little boys, suck it up. Act like a man. 
Quit crying like a little punk. Why are you acting like a little baby? You're crying like a little girl. And we think we're doing something right because culture has taught men, especially men, that we are to be hard cased because of what's coming down the pipeline. But then what happens is men take those emotions that they don't have language for and we implode if we don't explode. And then God says, I never intended for you to mismanage emotions. And not dealing with emotions is mismanaging emotions. I'm going to get to that in a minute, all right? Let me prove to you that, that God is a God of emotions. He, uh, Hosea chapter 11 verse 8 says like this. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? This is God. He, this, 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 is the, this, this is him through the prophet. He says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned over. Look at that. Y'all read that with me? Read that with me. Come on, y'all. It's in, it's in your Bibles. My heart is turned over within me. Woo! Do y'all see that? I'm having, I'm having, I'm having emotions about this. My heart is moving in directions concerning this. God does feel, and he gave us the ability to feel as well. And he did that because he desired to have relationship with mankind. That God's initial design for emotions is for us to manage our own, but to also know how he's feeling. Are y'all here today? All right. So there's a whole bunch of tension here in the uh, in the Greek philosophical and Hebrew uh, conceptions. On one side, there is the immutability, or perfection, and all sufficiency of God, which would seem to include all passion. And this has been the basis of the traditional emphasis amongst theologians. Can I keep moving? Yeah. All right. So according to Help Guide, let me just give you this, write this down. There are four categories of emotional intelligence that I want to talk about before we jump into these relationships. You ready? Yeah. All right, here's the first one. Number one, self-awareness. Self-awareness. Write that down. Self-awareness. I got to be aware of myself. Why are we talking about this in church? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because some of y'all suck at relationships. You fall out with everybody. You ain't got to say amen, but you fall. If every season, let me tell you something. If you're an adult, like a whole adult, like a whole adult, I ain't talking about 21. I know they grown legally, but they ain't grown. Grown is when you got responsibilities managed well. So if you're 25 and you can handle responsibility well, then you're grown. But a lot of people are 40 years old and they're not grown. You're not grown because you don't handle responsibility. We got to beg you for child. Anyway, so <laughs> you're not grown. You're not grown. You're just not grown. You're not. Not grown. So let's keep moving. You're not. Fight me. You're not grown. So what happens is a lot of us suck in relationships because we have no emotional awareness. We suck at it. So number one, self-awareness. Shout self-awareness. Self number two, write it down. Self-management. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ. That's a hard one. Now, y'all, take those down. You give me, you're going ahead of me in my points. I'm just introducing them. Vanish. All right. <laughs> See? <laughs> you give, you, man, you can't give them the answers yet. <laughs> Number three, social awareness. Write that down. Social awareness. So self-awareness, self-management, social awareness. Here's the third one, relationship management. All right. We're going to travel. Y'all want to see a panel on this? Good, because I'm putting one together this week. All right. So what, so what does the Bible say about emotional intelligence? Proverbs 29, 11 says it like this. You ready? Proverbs 29, 11. It says, fools vent their anger. Oh, Lord Jesus. But the wise 
quietly hold it back. You're saying, where's the emotional intelligence then, apostle? It's the wisdom to restrain. Real emotional intelligence is when you know how to withhold what you know could destroy. And some of y'all in this room are really good with not holding back. All right, let's talk about me. Because it, it, here it is, Brandon, because you know the Saints, boy. Yeah. Let me talk about me. So I like flying the friendly skies. And when I travel, I do ask for certain accommodations. I do. Because I have paid my dues. <laughs> After 25 years of preaching, I have paid my dues. I've sat with many of babies who have, you know, just went crazy, sold themselves. I have done it. I have been, I have been in these places. So now if I'm going to have my mental health intact, I got to be able to get on and get off the plane. It's not about trying to be, no, I need to get on quick, put my headphones on. Those who travel with me know I got my hoodie on my head. I'm looking down. I don't want to stop. I don't want to pray for nobody right now. I just want to just get my ears already popping. They're getting ready to pop. I'm already a little irritable. The gum is not working. All that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm sitting, and I like to sit first class. And when I travel, I'm going to pay to sit where I want to sit. I like that. I hope you like that. Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to say, please. So, so I'm going to tell on me because I, I got to tell on me, all right? All right, because a fool loses his temper. So I'm sitting in the chair, oh, Lord, yesterday. Coming from Chicago, headed back to San Antonio. I'm sitting in first class. Chris, we were on our way up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in first class, sitting there, and this man walks past me and makes a comment. Because I'm sitting in first class. And uh, he says to his lady, Pastor Dan, he says, I guess I need to start selling crack. Okay, emotional intelligence. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. I mean, it, man, I mean, you see it? The whole room. That's what he said, Elder Pettis. That's what he said. So, if you was raised at 4235 Dysart in Eastwood by Elder Leroy and Linda Duhart, and then raised at 443 Missy Springs of Sunrise, who both parents were from, one from Corliss Street on the east side and my mama from East Terrace. There's a, there's a certain way I was taught to respond. It was implied, Apostle, it was implied. And so for me, when I realized I had to fact check. Did he say what I think he said? That's what he said. Leroy Duhart, senior and junior, manifested in my soul on an airplane. I yesterday became almost a TikTok. 
I jumped up, took the seatbelt off, turned around, and started going toward the man. Poor little Asian lady between us. She, she looked back over, my, over her shoulder like, Today I would have been on, first of all, in jail. And then I would have been live. Or it would have been shared. But I had to get my emotional man under control. I sat back in my chair. I put on my beats. I turned on my AC because I was hot. I strapped back in my seatbelt. I finished writing this message. <laughs> Here's the victory. He was probably sitting in Z22, all the way in the back. <laughs> That's not a Z on a plane, but I just said he's sitting. They're like, see y'all later. Everybody say emotional intelligence. You got to be able to keep your mind together. God gave us emotions, Britain, but we got to manage them well. I would have embarrassed all of y'all. I don't like this. This message is not going the way I planned it. This should have been weeping and repentance. Nisha, weeping and repentance, Nish. They up here celebrating. <laughs> so I wouldn't embarrass y'all. No, you wouldn't have. No, no. We would have bailed you out, Apostle. We would have went on. That show, what's his name? Bumpy Johnson. He, he let everybody out. <sighs> All right, y'all, listen. We got to get our emotional man under control. All right. <laughs> Proverbs 12. Can I keep moving? I got 13 more minutes. Proverbs 12. I got some work to cover, some ground to cover. Proverbs 12, verse 18. It says, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. That's you, that's you guys who know how to tear people off with your words. See, I'm a decent communicator, but I don't know how to argue. I know how to argue the text. I can argue. I can, I can apologize. I can do that. I can't argue with you one on one. Most men can't argue with you one on one. You're too quick. It's too fast. It's too rapid. It's just too. It's too. Just too many words too soon. I'm trying to comprehend the last thing you said ten minutes ago. I'm still figuring that one out, and you didn't hit me with all this rapid fire. And please don't be articulate, because it's like. Most of us sit here like, <laughs> but the tongue of the wise, come on, y'all, what does it do? It brings healing. The scripture says, a soft answer turns away wrath. You got to know how to talk to people you're in relationship with. I think one of the greatest issues I have, with, one of the greatest issues and things that I've, I've learned to work on over the years, I'm still growing, is that I know how to diffuse uh, moments of, of, of confrontation by waiting for the right moment to heal you before I correct you. Let me speak to this first and affirm you and let you know I'm here. I'm not leaving you because of this. I'm here. I'm present. You hear? You got it? You got it? All right. Don't ever do that again. 
I love you, right? You know that? Yeah, I know. Okay. Don't ever do that again. Do that again, I'm going to bust your head. But I love you. But if you do that again, you get it? Yeah. I see most of it. So the tongue of the wise brings healing. Today, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are in your world of influence, those that you love, those that you love deeply, practice healing with your words. Do not call your kids names. I don't care who their mama and daddy is. Do not call your kids, don't call your nephews and nieces names. You know, some of y'all do that too. You compare your children because you don't like their mama. Oh, man, it's quiet. That's all right. Okay. So, Denisha, you're going to like this. Uh, psychologist Mark Brackett says that he works for the Yale Center of uh, Emotional Intelligence. And he argues that this tendency uh, to avoid feelings, uh, though understandable, is actually makes you at a disadvantage. So he did an experiment, okay, Dr. Hope. He did an experiment where he brought in colleagues of a particular middle school, all middle school teachers, and he split them into two groups. The first group of people, men and female teachers, he put them in a room and he asked them, how has your, tell me the positive things about your teaching experience. And they were telling him about the positive things. He's like, oh, man. It's like 20 women and men talking about the positive parts about teaching, what they love about teaching, et cetera. Put them in the room. Then he asked the other group, man, give me some of the worst moments you've had, the difficulties with parents. And they started complaining and lamenting and being frustrated. He put them in another room. He gave them all service, uh, essays. He said, I want you to grade these essays of these kids. They said, okay. They graded them. Found out that in the classroom that had the teachers who had, that he made them think about the bad experiences, they literally grade the kids a whole grade lower. A whole character grade lower than those who had a positive, uh, positive question being asked. Because their emotional man was in the way of their clarity of what they were looking at. So you cannot say that who, how we feel about things does not deter what reality really is. And if our emotional person is not under control, then we see the light, we see life through the lens of our emotions. So if you're always frustrated, you see life through frustration. That when somebody does something decent for you with no strings attached, you call it an agenda. Oh, he got a motive. I already not seen that before. Nope. 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 Oh, no, no, no. I don't trust these females. No, I don't trust none of these females. Nope. We, we automatically go to female. We go to biblical uh, Genesis chapter 1 language. I don't trust these females. Like, whoa. Whoa, bro. How about you don't trust her? Like, females? You met them all? You get it? Because when, when, when we're hurt, we see life through the lens of the hurt. You see the whole, all churches do this. No, that church did that. And it wasn't even the church. It was that one person. All pastors. You don't even know all pastors. I'm a pastor. I don't know all pastors. It wasn't all pastors. It was that pastor. You got it? Man, church folk be acting funny. No, that person was acting funny. But when you've been hurt, you see it through the lens of everybody when in actuality it was one person. All right? No, somebody tell them, don't do that. Now, let's go back to self-awareness. Y'all ready? I got seven minutes and I'm coming, coming to my close. Self-awareness. Here's the first thing about self-awareness. And you write this down, take a picture if you need to. But ask yourself, why do you do the things that you do? That's self-awareness. Why do I do what I do? These are regular questions to help you build your emotional man. You ready? Why do I do the things I do? Why do I say what I say? Why do I cuss this much? One of my mentors, uh, Dr. Hart Ramsey, said, when you cuss a lot, it's because you're angry. 
So the bigger question is, what's going on in me that's got me so angry? Why am I always so ticked off? I'm talking to you cussers, you professional cussers. There's no judgment in the rock. It's a safe house. But you still be cussing everybody out. If your first retort is you bleed and bleed, and I tell you bleed and and bleed. There's anger in there. You got it? There's anger in there. And we got to ask the real question. The, the real issue is not this issue. The issue is why are you so continually angry? What is this cycle of anger in you, and why haven't you addressed it? Because it's not these people. It probably started decades ago. Ask yourself last, when did I start talking like this? You got it? Self-awareness. Uh-oh. Reflect on your personal values to understand the why behind uh, what you do. Lastly, get clear on your emotions to understand what you feel and why. All right? Take a picture of it. Here's the next one. Self-management. This is for all of us. Close your eyes. Breathe deeply for a few moments to be more present. Some of us just aren't present. I was away at a conference, and I, I was able like that. No, I was so happy that none of us picked up our phones to take pictures. I was like, yo, we graduated. We just present. Putting the phones face down so we can break bread and talk. Present. When the last time you sat at dinner and had a conversation and everybody wasn't doing something different? Present. Y'all here? Not just present with your boo, but present with your siblings. Present with your folks. Present with your friends. Just present. I'm not talking about present in Cancun. I'm a president in San Antonio. Pre- or on the phone. Present. Because you know, boy, y'all, woo-wee, we be some multitasking folk. I'm talking to you on speakerphone, but I am having a hold of the conversation by text with somebody else. And sometimes about you. You're not present. Yep, I'm talking to him right now. That's what the fingers are saying. you like, mm-hmm, yep. And that, like they can't hear the whoop. (laughs) They can hear it, whoop. (laughs) Bing. (laughs) I call people out, but who you talking to while I'm talking? I don't call you no more, you keep talking to other people I'm talking to you. (laughs) Can I keep going? (laughs) Reframe the situation. Reframe self-management. Reframe the situation to see if you can find a silver lining. Like this is this is real strong self-management, Mama, uh, 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 Chris. Strong. This is strong self-management when you can actually sit there and reframe the situation. When you look at it again, and you see how thing, and then you try to figure out how can we be okay. Not how can I leave you alone. I, I'm tired. I'm tired. I ain't. I'm, that's, I, that's the last time I'm out. I tell you, but how can I? What can the silver lining look like? You know what I mean? Take time to solve complex problems in your life and find the right solutions for you. In Christ. I have to add that. Everybody say in Christ. Because the right solution might not be drinking. So you're going to tear your liver up because you don't want to deal with your emotions? And then need a miracle? Don't do that to yourself. Love you. Here's the, here's the framework, right? Here, here it is, believers. And I got this this weekend. Pastor John Gray was, was, was preaching. No, he was not preaching. He was, in the, he was in having dinner. And he said this. And it just messed me up. John said, he said, it's God, then you. I ain't never heard that. I've heard God, family, church. He said, no, no, no. It's God, 
then you. Then your family. Then your purpose. Then your ministry. I have never heard that before. I said, what? He said, no, no. If you're not important to you, none of this other stuff is going to matter. You won't even live to see none of that. So you got to learn how to manage you. And you got to have people in your circle that can help you by telling you the truth about who you are. I ask my friends all the time, hey, man, all right, man, I know I've been wilding. Y'all, come on, let me have it. What I need to work on. First of all, uh, Duhart, quit trying to, uh, you don't multitask well. So <laughs> they'll, they'll tell me that. But when people ask, when you got people in your space who try to tell you why you always look like this, you can't get mad. You got to be like, okay, let me, okay, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me think about that. Let me, let me, okay. They ask me to say, why well, I always say this. You're right. I do be saying that quite a bit. I do. Let me. I don't like the fact you're calling me out right now. I feel violated, but you know, but it's true. I be wilding. All right. Okay. I'll work on it. You know what I'm saying? That's having self-management. Inviting people into the journey with you. I'm always asking for, how can I do better? How can I do this? How can I do it? What does it sound like? How can I get, what do I need to, yeah. All right, here's the next one. Take care of your body and your health. Brothers, can I encourage you? Go get your feet done. They didn't expect that. That thought was gonna say go to the gym. <laughs> get your feet done. Get your feet done. Go get your feet done. It feel good when your feet done, man. I promise you. I know you got a lot going on. It's got a whole Vietnam on your feet, but I get it. I mean, foot looks sepsis. But, uh, <laughs> but get, let them shave it off and saw it back. Let them get that pummel stone in. Rub that heel out real good. Smooth that out. You know what I'm saying? Lotion on feet. Make it a ritual. So you ain't looking half light skinned. <laughs> I know that one toe black. It's all right. It ain't moving yet. Cut it back, trim it, manicure it. Believe God, it's going to look like the rest of them. <laughs> Wear looser shoes. <laughs> to self-management. Manicure your hands. It's not manly to have compacted dirt underneath it. On a regular basis, I'm, I'm, when you work in it, I get that. You got oil and all that. I get that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you out and about and stuff, you know, at least, at least clean it out. Come on, ladies, say amen to this. Help me out. See? She wants you to do it. It's for y'all. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you work out in the gym and you lift a lot, wear gloves. So you ain't got them calluses all up in there. So when you rub her back, she ain't sitting up here scraped. <laughs> Trying to be into it like. <laughs> Sit on the couch like. Oh, boy. Somebody shot emotional intelligence. Yeah, that's part of it, self-management. Brothers, we got to change our diet, myself included. You know, some stuff is just bad for your gastric. Ladies, you too. Y'all hanging out or something and y'all around each other, you know, just... Don't get the salad on the, on, don't get the onions on the salad. Just don't do it in that moment. We know you like it, but don't have it then. Because <laughs> it don't matter how much you brush, that don't go nowhere. You had onions today? 
at 11. <laughs> he was like 7.30. He still... <laughs> Y'all got it? Take care of yourself. Look at somebody and tell them, take care of yourself. Get your hair done. Get your nails done. Right, ladies? Get your nails done. Get your hair done. Spray yourself with something nice. Save your money. Put, get you a nice perfume. Not the alcohol base. Get an oil base. Spray yourself. And then one in the walk into that and the mist hits you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Treat yourself. You only got one you. That's why people are so upset all the time, because they don't take care of themselves. Your emotional man is jacked up because you take care of everybody else, but you're not taking care of you. Find out what you like to do and do it. And have a blast doing it. And turn your phone off. God, dog, every time we look up, you ain't got to post where you at and what you doing and social media for a bunch of people. Enjoy them. Take a deep breath. Put that phone down. Uninstall Instagram for a moment. Right? Here's number three. Be so social awareness. What does that look like? Be more present in your social interactions. Right? We got to be more present. When we're talking to somebody, we're having a good time, be present. you having a conversation with somebody you haven't seen in a while, don't be so quick to get away. Like, hey, how you doing? All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Y'all be good. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Praise God. Yeah. Stop. How many last time you asked somebody, hey, how you doing? And you waited to see what they were going to say. Like, hey, how you doing? Be like, I'm doing okay. You sure? Like, ask them. Be more socially interactive and be more present in the moment when you're dealing with people. That's how we love one another. When you ask your kids, how was school today? Be like, fine. You be like, okay, cool. No. Probe around a little bit. Hey, what's going on? You all right? Okay. Well, look, let's have a seat. What's going on? You know, they may not like it. Oh, man. I'm just playing my day. Brothers, let me help you out. You, you ask her, hey, how was your day? It's, it's going to be, a, it's, it's going to be, you're going to have, <laughs> you're going to know. You're going to know how the day went. When you ask him, he's going to tell you. He's going to use the best adjective he has. It was cool. <laughs> it was all right. Here's another one. Works, work. He just told you, today was a rough day. I got in the office, and it's just, just got to learn how to speak man. Don't make him speak woman. We're not wired for that. Man don't, men don't speak woman. Well, you got to tell me. I, no, I don't, I'm not going to. It's, it's just the work. It's the job. It was all right. It was a cool day. I went to lunch. I had some projects to finish. I got to go back tomorrow. <laughs> Come on, brothers. I'm helping us out. Yeah. He ain't going to say that. Well, emotionally, I was having a moment because the boss had asked me a really difficult question. And, and no, that's not what he's going to do. He's going to be like, it was all right. It was all right. Cool. It was cool. You know. Work, work. <laughs> Let's keep moving. All right. Practice empathy and compassion to better understand why people who are different from you do the things they do. And lastly, have a back pocket question on hand or a question you can ask to start up a conversation or diffuse awkwardness. Have a back pocket question on hand. So when, you, when a person is talking, if you know something about them, maybe a cousin or a loved one, ask a back pocket question. How you doing? I'm doing good. Man, how's your cousin? I don't know, last time we had talked, you had have a back pocket question. Practice it today when church is over with in a few minutes. Have a back pocket. We all come to, in the foyer and you talk, hey, da, da, da. The, what the, what's the last thing they told you about two weeks ago? Bring that back up. And then wait to hear what they say. 
Everybody like, is it going to work today, Apostle? Because I know why they're asking. <laughs> Number four, everybody say this, relationship management. Here it is. Practice gratitude for all the little things. Somebody wash the dishes, be grateful. Somebody vacuum, kids, your parents vacuuming, please be grateful. If you go to school and you come home and your parents clean your room, just be like, you know, thank you for doing that. Because that's definitely my responsibility. If your kids take out the trash, say thank you. If somebody irons something for you, just say thank you. Y'all got it? Small things. Just little small things. Just little be small things. I mean, little be small things. Say thank you. Express your emotions by telling other people when you appreciate them, care for them, admire them, or feel positive about them in some way. Another one, explain your decisions and be willing to listen to why others make the decisions that they make. All right, can I give you a few strategies that I, I did learn to help strengthen your emotional intelligence? All right, number one, pay attention to your emotions. Write that down. Pay attention to your emotions. Pay attention to them. Write it down. It's not going to be on the screen for you. Pay attention to your emotions. Your emotions are telling you something. It's like back pain or side pain or stomach pain. If you feel it, Didi, it's like ask yourself the question, okay, why is my stomach doing this? And the older you get, some pains are phantom. They just, they just appear. You don't know what that's for. Like, ooh, you know. But pay attention because sometimes these body tensions are telling you something. And oftentimes it's not an organ thing. It's an emotional thing. Because if you don't deal with something, that thing will start dealing in your flesh. All right, number two, ask yourself, is, the right, is this the right time and place? In other words, stop and think before you act or speak. The plane is not the right time and space to have a conversation. It's not the right time. It's not. Now, outside might be better, but the plane is not the place to have that kind of conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah. You got to ask yourself the right question. The right, is this, should I respond in this mall right now the way I want to respond? Right. No. Should I say something outside Walmart right now? No. Have enough emotional intelligence to tell yourself, I'm not going to embarrass me. I'm going to wait. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to breathe out. I'm going to think. I'm going to strategize. And then I'm going to respond and I react. All right? I get it because some of of us didn't learn this. All right? Uh All right. Here's number three. Reflect on the emotions of those around you. Reflect on the emotions of those around you. This is when you start seeing that self-awareness. Reflect on the emotions of the people around you. All right? Number four, don't try to be a mind reader. (laughs) Because the truth of the matter is you're not going to always know how other people feel. You're not. And they're not always going to tell you. Some folk are mad right now. They're sitting next to you. And they are pissed off. They smell good. They look good. They are at church. They even say hallelujah. But they are upset. At home, somebody got them fired up and ready to go. All right? Number five, become more empathetic. It means try to feel what people are feeling. And if you walk through what they walk through, feel it from that place. Remember how you felt. Am I going too fast? Number six, have a growth mindset. Now, let me help you with this one. It's going to be hard. Man. Learn from criticism. Let people critique you that you trust. People you love, people you know that love you. Ask them to critique you. Your character. How you're building, what you're doing. I invite people to that journey on a regular basis. When I'm done preaching, sometimes I ask the question, was it clear? Did it make sense? Because I, I want to be critiqued. How can I do it better? Number seven. Here's a big one. Keep working at it. Because it won't happen overnight. It takes a lot of practice to work these. Y'all got it? All right. I'm out of time. But I do have more scriptures. And can I give you this last scripture? All right. Numbers 20, verse 1. And I'm done. I promise you. I'm over. Numbers 20. Numbers 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. All right, let's read it together. Well, they don't have it, but I'll read it to you. It says, then the sons of Israel, they do have it. Let's read it. 
Then the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. This whole first verse is loaded. It is pregnant with revelation. I don't have time to break it all down, but I got time to focus on one particular piece. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. Then verse 2 says, there was no water for the congregation. And they assembled themselves Come on, y'all. Against who? Let's keep reading. The people thus continued with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord, why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into the... Why you bring us out into the wilderness? For us and our beasts to die. Thus... You shall bring forth water from, uh, from the... Okay, I didn't skip down to verse 43. What is this? I'm sorry. It skipped down. I'm so sorry. I don't have it all. Let me tell you the story. So when this happened, Moses is like, okay. So Moses and Aaron go back to God, Jarrell. They have a conversation with God, emotional intelligence. And he says, God, these people are thirsty. They mad at me. They out here. They thirsty. There's a lot going on. What are you going to do? God tells Moses, he says, Moses, what I want you to do, man, you and your staff, I want you to go to the rock and y'all speak to it. Speak to the rock and it'll show Israel who I am. Once again, once again, speak to the rock. It's going to show Israel who I am. Moses left that conversation with God, went down to the camp. Still frustrated. Still hadn't had his emotional man under control. He took his staff just by looking at them and hit the rock. The water came out and God says, you can't take them in to the promise. What I promise y'all, you won't see it. Because you messed up an opportunity to show them how holy I was. Oh, y'all ready for this? I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Go to verse, go to verse 12. Go to verse 12. No, verse 11. Is there? Verse 11, I think. I, verse 11 says, then read it with verse 11. Let's see. If y'all don't have it, don't worry about it. Verse 11, verse 11, verse 11, verse 11. Okay, I'll read it to you while they work that out. Then Moses lifted up his hand, struck the rock, the rock twice. With his rod. They, thank you, God. Okay. And water did what? Came forth abundantly. Read it with me. And the congregation and their animals drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me. Come on, y'all. To treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. I saw that and I said, well, I knew the story, but this is a mystery here. I knew that Moses had issues with his anger and emotion. He killed a man, too, specifically for beating folk, you know, you know, beating, beating Hebrews. I, I get it. Now we're on this side of it. He's been frustrated. I get it. And now God tells him a direct order. And because he didn't have his emotional man to control... He broke that too. It cost him going in because God says, you're not responsible enough to do what I told you. You let your man, your inner man, your soul get in the way of promise. So you can't leave because you missed up an opportunity to show them how holy I was. But I'm going to argue and submit something to you and I'm done. I'm going to drop the mic right here. I'm going to argue, Apostle, that this is really serious. Because this happened where they buried Miriam. Why would the Bible mention that? Because Miriam's name, well, really the argument is found in um, verse 10. Go to verse 10 real quick. Read it with me. 
And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, he says, listen, rebels. I think he was so tapped out emotionally. Even after the death of his sister. You know why? Because Miriam did the same thing to him. Early on. And Miriam's name means rebellion. He never mastered, even with the sons of Korah, he never mastered anger when it came to betrayal. And because he couldn't keep his, his soul under control, he messed up an opportunity to present God in a healthy dynamic. To some people, come on now, and how many times have we messed up representing Christ because we gave them our soul that we did not manage? Y'all got it? Lay your hands on your chest. I'm done. Say this with me. Father, for the next few weeks, help me manage my soul. Teach me how to be emotionally aware of what's going on in me. In Jesus' name.